Welcome. It is day 15 for some of you, day 5 for others of you. We have, for week 3, one last programmatic event. And we sort of saved our speaker today for the weeks of the workshops when you're really delving in to a lot of issues, being able to spend a deeper amount of time on them. And many of you have chosen to struggle with issues of complexity, um, issues of measuring impact, um, issues of determining attribution, and searching for other ways to do it than our uh, impact evaluation methods, which sometimes we can apply and sometimes we cannot. This is why we thought that John Maine would be such a good speaker for the end of this week. John is a, uh, first and foremost, um, a very distinguished um, um, ex-public servant and spent uh, much of his career in the office of the Auditor General. Uh, Ray would use adjectives to describe um, John's contributions as profound. Right? Um, he is uh, one of the first thinkers, probably, on performance, performance evaluation, performance measurement, what a performance system is and should uh, look like, and has made uh, contributions on that that now are reflected in uh, the Canadian government. He uh, works now still as an advisor. I love his card. It was the first time I saw a business card that had advisor on it. I said, gee, I want one like that. That looks great. Uh, but he works with many, many people, many of the UN agencies, the European Union, and uh, uh, even IDRC locally. Uh, he has written so many articles, contributed to so many books, um, that I could not begin to, to list them. But he has, and I think he may be one of very, very few people who have not just once, but twice uh, been awarded by the Canadian Evaluation Society for contribution to evaluation in Canada. It's quite an achievement to get that and almost unheard of to get it twice. So um, John has, among the subjects that he has written on and really been a thoughtful voice in the evaluation community, is that of getting past attribution, thinking about contribution, and thinking about what that means, what is uh, contribution analysis. How do you do that? What do you do? What are the issues involved in it? And uh, he's got several papers uh, that are on this topic alone, but I'm delighted that you're going to have the treat of hearing John himself talk on this issue. So without further ado, a big ifdet welcome to John Maine. Good afternoon. Uh, Carry on eating. Um, I, it's a great pleasure to be here. I take this opportunity to sort of talk to you about some issues I think are, are kind of important to get your head around. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I have uh, uh, quite deliberately some years ago picked the advisor title, uh, which I sort of contrast as someone that doesn't actually have to do anything, just mouth off on things, as opposed to a consultant who may actually have to deliver products. But, it's, it's, it's sort of worked out. Um, <clears throat> so today I would like to talk about uh, the issue of uh, uh, causal, cause and effect in the kind of interventions that you are all involved with. The kind of interventions we're dealing with, you're all dealing with, are trying to bring about uh, development impacts, um, improve lives of, of beneficiaries. Um, but of course, uh, they're not acting on their own. Um, there may be... Um, other events happening, socioeconomic 
things going on, other interventions from other organizations, governments involved, NGOs affecting, involved in the, uh, in the, in the same context, and other, other kinds of contextual factors that might be relevant. Uh, and the development impacts result from that whole mix of all those actions together. So the question I'm been always interested in is, given this context, what can we say about uh, the intervention that you're interested in, any uh, observed results that you've actually seen? Uh, can you talk about, has the intervention caused the results? Does that make any sense? Uh, does, has the intervention made a difference? What might that mean? Um, has the intervention contributed to the results? Um, or perhaps that sort of attribution question, is the intervention going to be attributed to some net effect type of thing? Um, those are all the kinds of issues that are floating around this issue of making, making causal claims. Uh, what, what makes sense given the context that you're, you're involved with? And I want to um, use a, an example, a hypothetical example that I've, that I've used. And I must, I must say at the outset that quite a bit of these, some of these ideas have come out recently in a, in a DFID study that I was involved in, Elliot Stern was leading, uh, that I think um, uh, Linda has sent to everybody, uh, the link to it, uh, and I'll have the link at the end of the presentation, uh, where a lot of these ideas and other, I think, good stuff was, uh, was developed. If you think of an intervention, this one is trying to improve educational outcome for girls. Um, through uh, trying to uh, increase the skills and awareness of teachers in dealing with, with, uh, with girls. The idea is that uh, uh, if you're able to increase the, the awareness of special needs, uh, the situation of girls in schools, their attitude and the teachers' attitudes towards educating girls, that that will, that will lead to um, uh, teachers providing better, and more, better training for girls, uh, more attuned to, to their interests and needs, uh, so the girls will be more actively engaged in, edu in education, wanting an education, and this would then lead to better outcomes. That's sort of a, kind of an intervention. I've listed here some other kinds of factors that are obviously part of that, of that context, uh, the extent to which the teachers are in fact willing to, to sort of support the idea of education of girls support of parents to, uh, for their daughters to attend schools, study at home, that kind of support. Uh, just can the girls actually get to the schools um, and, and, and the kind of accommodation they have at the schools. These are some of the factors that are, would be I influencing the outcomes and I'm, you can probably think of, of some others. Um, so the question is, uh, in that context, if you, if you observe higher educational outcomes after a period of time, what, can you, what does that have to do with the intervention? What can you say about the link between those two? What can we say about an intervention and an impact? Um, if you think of that example, can, does it make sense to say that, that the intervention caused the result? I would, I would argue no. I mean, that, that, it's a complicated story there. It's not that simple to say it, it caused the results. A lot of discussion of causality deals with necessary and sufficient conditions. What is, is the, would the intervention in that case be necessary for the, for the outcome of getting higher education, edu better educational outcomes? Well, again, I think most of the uh, kind of interventions that we're dealing with, the answer is no. There's other, lots of other ways you can imagine enhancing uh, the education of, uh, of girls, perhaps building separate schools for girls, perhaps increasing the teacher-student ratio. Uh, there may be a variety of ways you can do that uh, other than just the intervention. So the intervention isn't necessary in that sense uh, for, the, for the result. Is it sufficient for the result? Well, again, I think the answer is no. We've uh, suggested that there's a lot of other factors involved that have to be, happen in order for the, for the results to bring about. Um, so where are we? We would still like to see some link between the intervention and, and the impact. Now these issues of causality have been around for uh, centuries indeed um, and there's a huge literature out there and, 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 and answers to those apparent conundrums. And the, the idea that um, uh, I think is, is important here is that this intervention is clearly part of a causal package. If, if the intervention works and this whole this causal package, that's the intervention plus those other assumptions and supporting factors, are in fact sufficient to bring about the the impact. And further, if the intervention is working, 
then it's an essential part of that package, that if you didn't have the intervention and you just had the other factors, that wouldn't be enough to, to bring about the, the outcomes you're talking about. So this kind of concept of, of causality is, um, is called Innes causality. I'm not going to spend any time on this. It was introduced by a guy, Mackey, in 1974. Um, and he argued that much of the time we are talking about this kind of causality, which, as we'll I'll say shortly, is sort of conditional uh, causes. I'm suggesting that a useful operational definition then of making a difference, that the intervention made a difference, when uh, the, interven the intervention causal package was sufficient to bring about the impact, and the intervention was a necessary component of that causal package. Uh, and this is called a contributory cause. So it's neither sufficient nor necessary, it's a contributory cause. Uh, and indeed, I would argue that most interventions that we're dealing with are of that nature. They're not, uh, uh, they're not a, a sort of an a, agricultural research experiment where you're planting a crop and trying to see the variations where life is much more simple. Uh, smoking and lung cancer is, an, is a, is a well-known example where smoking is a contributory cause to lung cancer. It's not necessary uh, because you can get lung cancer even if you haven't smoked, and it's not sufficient because people that smoke, uh, some of them don't get, don't get cancer. So, but it is a contributory mm -hmm. cause. Smoking plus other factors uh, will end up with lung cancer. Now, a, f a further issue. So I think this idea of a contributory cause is fairly important, and that's uh, one of the uh, just, um, conclusions that we talked about in this that DFID report I mentioned, uh, that this is a much more useful way of thinking about um, causality and interventions. Um, now, uh, further, um, the intervention is, is one of, of many causes. There's all those others. So that's, again, a little un unsettling because you're kind of, you're interested in the, in the intervention itself. Um, I, I would argue we, we expect more from, from most of our interventions. Perhaps that it acts as a trigger to sort of start the causal chain of things. Um, Rob Vandenberg has used the phrase, the uh, spark that lights the fire idea as a concept of, of its interventions that sort of are there to get things going and then hopefully they will, they will uh, uh, act with these other supporting factors and carry on and, and, and produce the kind of results you're hoping for. Um, they may also, or, or, or either, act as a sustaining uh, support so that as things go on, the intervention might uh, try to uh, s support uh, actions and other, some of those other factors that are helping to sort of improve uh, the state of affairs. Something like adding gasoline in the fire to keep it going from time to time. And I've labeled these, uh, this idea of a, of a principal contributory cause. Uh, that the intervention is a, is a, can be thought of as a, you hope that the intervention is a principal contributory cause. Uh, and that's what you, that's a, I think a very useful way to conceptualize it. One of the outputs of this then is um, uh, what, and it's one of, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about this contribution analysis, but um, Part of, the, part of the question is, is, is not, sometimes not being clear on what is the question you're asking, and a, particularly in, in an issue of uh, causal uh, issues. Uh, it's, it's kind of important to think through what are the different types of causal questions that are, that are meaningful and can be answered. So we've talked about has the intervention made a difference, and I've, I've defined what that, I think, can usefully mean. Um, it's, uh, uh, is the contribution a contributory cause? And, what contribution has, has the intervention made? But we're also interested in another type of impact question, which is why, have, why has the impact occurred? So what are the, how did the various, these various causal factors, the inter intervention and, and the supporting factors uh, bring about the result? Um, this is uh, what was the context around the intervention and, and what are the mechanisms? And what role did intervention play? Was it a was it a principal contributory cause? So the obviously next question is how would you go about demonstrating that an intervention is a is a contributory cause? Um, and I want to uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Um, I don't want to get into too much detail uh, at this luncheon luncheon talk, but I think it connects well with theory-based approaches that I'll talk about in a minute, 
um, and, it, and it needs uh, to think about causality in terms of generative causality that I'll speak to very briefly. There's, I'm going to mention uh, contribution analysis, but there are other approaches to, do, to answering some of these questions, such as quantitative comparative analysis, which is sort of more and more coming on the scene in evaluation. Um, theories of change, for me, is not just a, lo a logic model or a results chain, but it's that plus the assumptions and risks that are behind the links in the chain. It explains what has to happen in order for the intervention to work. In the reduced smoking campaign, you have an anti-smoking campaign, that's, that's sort of a logic model, but what we really want is uh, uh, what are the assumptions to make that, make that link work. I'm not, so that's sort of the idea of what I, th I call a theory of change, much more than just a logic model. There we are. Um, so if you had a whole up the center there, a sort of a standard results chain logic model, then all the assumptions you need to make the links work, external factors, that, all that sort of stuff. So I'm sort of assuming there's some familiarity with, with the idea of theories of change to sort of lay out, explain what the intervention's all about. Well, the link that I think is interesting is that uh, the way I've been talking, theories of change are in fact causal packages and more. They're, uh, they identify the supporting factors, the assumptions, the risks, confounding factors that are involved, but they also set out the relationships among the supporting factors. So a standard causal package would just sort of say, here's the various factors at work. A theory of change will try to show you the relationships among them. So that the idea is, or the, I think the, the relationship is that the, the theory of change is a model of the intervention as a contributory cause. And that makes the link with the whole theory-based approaches to evaluation. Um, now, if we move on to the sort of this issue of causality, and I, uh, we, uh, and I don't, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but there are at least four different ways of thinking about causality. Most often you only hear talk about the second one up there, the counterfactual framework. Um, but there are re regulatory frameworks, which is the when you do a statistical association between cause and effect, there's comparative frameworks that are used uh, on the basis for that quantitative comparative analysis stuff. And there's generative frameworks, which identify the causal links uh, and mechanisms that explain why effects are, are uh, brought about. And the generative frameworks, I think, are the ones that I want to talk about and that are sort of the basis for theory-based approaches. Again, the point being that, I didn't, last year here I spent much more time on this, but um, so often you see the only way to think about causality is through counterfactual, and I reject that completely. Uh, there's quite a few different ways of thinking about causality. These are well discussed in the philosophic literature, um, and a lot of good discussion on that in that uh, DFID report I mentioned. Generative causality uh, is sort of looking at the, the process that brings about uh, an, an impact, and it's tracing the links in sort of causal chains. And it's also, I suspect, uh, close to what in every day we think about causality. We tend to, when we talk about in casual talk, A cause B, um, we sort of mean that there's a bunch of events occurred. Either it was a direct event, your cue hit the billiard ball, or, or there's a bunch of other events that you can trace back to sort of understand the, the, causal, the causal relationship. And many professions use this, this, this is their model of, of, uh, of causality. It's not uh, counterfactual type thinking about causality. And it's the basis for theory-based approaches. Um, one of those is contribution analysis that I've uh, written about uh, a variety of times. And very quickly, I'm gonna give you, there's some references here and you may, you probably have others. It's issue of deciding what is the causal question you wanna ask. And uh, I had set this out long before this insight, I think, into uh, what contributory causes are came about um, and the importance of sort of defining what the issue is you're addressing. Um, so I think that's sort of what is, the, what, are the, what is the causal question or questions that you're trying to get at. You've got to be careful on that. Um, you, you know, develop a, a theory of change, gather whatever evidence you have to verify uh, or not, uh, the, the theory of change that's there. Pull that together and, and see what the, what the story looks like. What kind of evidence then do you have that your, your intervention, the theory of change actually materialized uh, 
uh, from the evidence that you, that you look at. Um, usually there'll be weaknesses in that argument, so then you might seek out additional evidence to sort of support those aspects and um, sort of do an iterative kind of improvement. That's sort of the, the basic idea behind contribution analysis. It's just verifying the theory of change with the actual evidence that you're able to gather about uh, the intervention you're looking at. Now, uh, in uh, the contributory cause words, um, concepts, um, uh, indeed, uh, it, it's very easy to fit that into this idea of how do you establish a contributory cause. Uh, obviously, you presumably show that the results in the, in the positive case where things are working, the results occurred, the causal package is sufficient, meaning that the assumptions occurred and that as, as you do the analysis, if you've picked up any other things, any other factors, those are brought in and re the theory is revised, et cetera. And then that you've, you've sort of accounted for plausible alternative explanations. And finally, that you're able to show often just from s simple logic that the intervention was necessary for the package to be sufficient. That without the intervention, things just wouldn't have started or wouldn't have carried on. Um, so um, uh, the co contribution analysis is certainly one way to uh, establish whether or not uh, the extent to which an intervention is a contributory cause. Um, obviously, when, when the results you're expecting didn't occur, then you, then you go back and start questioning the, the theory of change that you've put forth. Uh, maybe there was some of the assumptions, some of the supporting factors didn't occur. Maybe those other things occurred that you didn't take, take account of. And you'd sort of explore why things didn't work. Was it the theory? Was it implementation? Usual kind of stuff. So that's kind of the, uh, uh, where I think uh, theory-based approaches and contribution analysis fits into this idea of interventions as, as contributory causes. So um, I think uh, uh, concluding, um, uh, I think we expect that in my language here, most interventions are principal contributory causes. Uh, and we've, we've talked about what that, what that means in, in practice. Um, we also want to know why the impact occurred and that sort of leads you to sort of more into the whole uh, theory-based approach to stuff and try to understand why, why things have occurred. Um, and the idea that linking that uh, uh, theories of change are models of intervention as contributory causes. And the reference I mentioned the, the, uh, at the top there is a DFID study that was done uh, where DFID realized that only a small portion of the programs that they, they fund were, could be looked at through uh, um, experimental designs, uh, looked, uh, put out a contract, which I, I uh, found very enlightening on their part to essentially look at this issue sort of in a research perspective and come up with, a, up with suggestions on how to think through alternative approaches to... Um, to uh, the usual experimental counterfactual thinking. Um, I think that was um, very, very good on their part. I, uh, I shouldn't say this, but that's, it would be impossible to imagine the Canadian CETA doing that. They, don't, <laughs> they wouldn't think of funding that kind of stuff. Um, the, um, I mentioned that the next issue of the journal evaluation that's coming out next month, I believe, is on contribution analysis. It's a special issue that I edited, and um, it has a number of, I think, good articles in there, including one by Franz Liu. Uh, Michael Patton, who's here next week, has an article in it, um, and a number of articles with some actual applications of contribution analysis in it. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to that coming out. The, the, the web link there is an earlier paper I did, but it's easily accessible on contribution analysis, and you probably, aware of the recent book on program theory, which is a pretty exhaustive treatment of program theory, use of program theories and stuff by Sue Funnell and, and uh, Patricia Rogers. Thank you. I want to thank John. I think some of uh, the adjectives that Ray would use um, really apply, it's thoughtful, it's um, um, intellectually moving us in a new direction. 
You can see the reflections of a lot of this if you were here for the core and look at how in IPDET we present this. A lot will seem, will seem familiar because it's part of the approach uh, that we very much teach here at IPDET. So it's had an influence also on, on us and on many of you who have been through that training. Um, we would like to take some questions. John has said he has some time to take a few. John, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, a, a great deal of the work on contribution analysis is based one way or another on um, theory-based evaluations and uh, theories of change. Um, Many, many of the theories of change are rather general and don't really spell out in enough detail the specific kinds of causal links and mechanisms that you would like to, like to test to, to think about a contribution. So I, I wondered what are some of the ways that you think people should be trying to strengthen theories of change or other theory-based models to have a more solid base for um, contribution analysis? Um, thank you, Michael. Um, I think that is a real issue. I think um, I, you see it, I see it all the time where people are, are talking about theories of change uh, when all they really are, have is a simple logic model with a few boxes and a few arrows. Um, and I think, as I said, uh, I think there's much more, much more to it. Um, I mean, I see um, the theories of change needing uh, to, in most, many cases, needing to be developed or if there's something existing then needs to be re-examined and challenged at the time of an evaluation. I think it needs to, it can be a participatory process, can be very useful to sort of involve uh, the, the, those involved in the program in uh, getting at why they're, uh, why they think things are supposed to work the way they do. Um, so this would sort of challenge perhaps an official diagram you've picked up somewhere. Um, I think there's also an element um, that's often not there uh, that I know Franz has written about. Uh, there's a lot of social theory around that ought to be brought to bear on aspects of interventions in terms of mechanisms and what, what sort of works and doesn't work in situations. Uh, I think those would all help to strengthen, uh, strengthen uh, theories of change. And I think it's mainly, I think, the evaluator's job as sort of a two hats if they're, they may both be developing something, but also it needs to be challenged challenged by, be it other reviewers, challenged by the clients or stakeholders. Um, and usually, if you get into that sort of participatory questioning mode, it becomes a very educational process. Um, also, of course, time consuming. But I think those are a variety of ways that you need to, you need to sort of get at. You get at, the, and we're talking again about the, the arrows in, in results change or logic models. Uh, what's behind those arrows? It's typically those are the questions, and those need to be pursued and pushed and challenged. And um, and if some of you have done this work, I mean, so often when you do that to an intervention that's been going for some time, the whole thing kind of falls apart. I mean, it sort of doesn't, it cannot too often sort of not make sense because it wasn't really thought through at the beginning as to how this was supposed to work. So the whole uh, challenging. Uh, using theories of change in that way, a sort of a challenge mechanism, um, is, uh, is, can be a very fruitful and useful exercise. And I think those are all ways of helping to strengthen uh, uh, theory, things called theories of change when, when they're just sort of very simple. Certainly in Canada, again, I, I'm, the, the sort of requirement now that all programs have logic models and results chains, whatever they call them, and it's just, it's now become just sort of a something you have to do. So you do it and you stick it in an appendix and it's sort of there. It's never, but they're never thoughtfully done. And, and unfortunately, never that thoughtfully looked at in an evaluation either. Uh, knowing of your expertise in many fields, including uh, philosophy and uh, those uh, topics, I have a question which is, uh, which I personally find difficult. The, so we're looking forward to your uh, viewpoints to that. You talk absolutely rightly about the rival hypothesis. Now the question is that I, 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 I keep thinking about is first, when do you stop with finding rival factors or making rival hypotheses that you use in the test of your program theory? And secondly, 
um, what is behind the coverage of the broadness of the field where you get your rival hypothesis from? And just to articulate that a little bit, in, in a number of behavioral interventions, more and more, uh, sometimes rival hypotheses come from neurosciences, biosciences. It's, it's not what we as people do, but what's going deep, deep inside. Okay, fantastic, but when do you stop and how do you know that? That is my, it's not my major question in life, but it's at least one of the questions. <laughs> well, um, a good question as, as expected. Um, I'd probably stop before you get into neurobiology <laughs> as a rival explanation. Um, uh, I think in most sort of practical situations of, of, of sort of development interventions, um, by, uh, I mean, keeping track of, uh, of sort of con contextual factors, things that have occurred over the life of the intervention um, in, in the country or in the, in the location uh, through media reports and th things like that. Um, I think that uh, one of the things I see a good advantage of having developed in theory of change is to you use that as the basis for constructing um, interviews. Uh, and that when you're then asking people to uh, res respond, to reflect on, on, on theories of change, on certain, on some of the key links in the theory of change, asking, um, I mean, do they think it happened? Why do they think it happened? What evidence do they have? And whether they think, and whether they have other, are there other reasons that, that, you know, that you as the outside evaluator may not be aware of uh, that have brought about um, uh, the, the link. Um, the, and I think that can be a, a very good way of sort of bringing forth uh, a good range of option, of, of possible uh, rival explanations, of the usual sort of asking the experts type of thing. Um, I, I, maybe I mentioned that um, there may be sort of rival explanations to the whole theory of change, possibly, but equally important is is that each link in the in the chain is is, is is what's going on there and why has that happened. And those are those are more um, sort of, I mean, one of the advantages of building a, a, a theory of change, a causal link, of course, is that the idea is that rather than going from the activities of the intervention to the final outcomes, which is a big jump, you break it down into sort of smaller steps. And each of those smaller steps should be more easy to verify our challenge. And then equally to say, okay, well, was there anything else that might have been going on at the time uh, that might have caused this or influenced uh, the, 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 this intermediate result, for example, that you're looking at? Um, I think, so I think in um, both in the uh, building the theory of change, uh, you could, uh, some of those questions could come up and you could ask sorts of things. Um, uh, so that would include sort of the interviewing stakeholders and beneficiaries, experts, and, and literature in the area or experience in other, other similar kind of interventions are all, all ways to do that. I, I do think it's, um, uh, I mean, obviously, for practical reasons, you, you, you only are probably going to only end up with a, with a few of these plausible rival hypotheses. Um, and uh, I don't see the kind of evaluations that I'm thinking of in terms of development I interventions as getting in, getting, uh, I mean, one issue you raised, Franz, was you, you can sort of take the theory of change down, you can, you can go into more and more detail down to sort of very, as you said, neurobiological reactions and all that sort of stuff. Well, uh, there's a room, for, there, there are interventions where that you may want to do that. Um, I suspect most that you're dealing with here are not. Um, but it, it's, 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 a, it's a point to remember that there may be, you still may, having done all that, you still may have missed um, alternative explanations. But that's part of, you can't prove sort of 100% scientifically most of these causal relations, but you can probably come up with very reasonable uh, uh, conclusions, very credible conclusions about the, the likelihood of, of, uh, of those interventions, likelihood of those causal factors. In fact, I didn't, I didn't have it on here because I didn't want to sort of get into it, but what I presented there in terms of causality, necessary and sufficiency was a kind of a deterministic vision of it's either necessary or sufficient. In fact, I think um, 
uh, in some of the writing that I've been doing, um, I talk about more realistically is talking about likely necessary conditions and likely sufficient conditions, meaning most of the time you need this assumption to make the thing work uh, because the reality is um, it's, things are never that black and white in real life. Uh, thank you for a thoughtful presentation. Uh, two common tools that we use uh, to look at uh, these issues of causality are uh, logic models, logical models, and also log frames for programs. I would like to know, based on your logic experience, I mean, how, how would you compare the pros and cons of each approach, uh, especially given the points that you made during your presentation? Well, as, as, as I said, my, uh, when you talk about logic models, I'm sort of imagining boxes and a bunch of arrows, and I'm saying that's maybe a good place to start, but I think you need, you know, it's not, in my view, a theory of change. Log frames are, uh, perhaps go another step in the right direction in terms of they, they do ask some questions about some of the assumptions, but usually they're quite limited in terms of what they can, how they can describe the, um, the, the relationships between various levels of, of uh, out outcomes and impacts. Um, so I, I just, it's not something I would, I would sort of argue for. I think, and there's various ways in the, 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 um, the book by uh, Funnel and Rogers, there's all kinds of examples of ways of, of uh, uh, displaying uh, theories of change uh, that get at, that do emphasize this issue of more focus on the links and what's behind them. Uh, so I, I think those, I think for a good understanding of why things are working, for a good understanding of contributory causes and why interventions are working or not working, you need rather more detail than uh, sort of certainly logic models and, 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 and log frame also, which are, you just need to keep going in that direction, but, but quite far. <laughs> um, I'm Kate Rieke, I work for CETA, and I think our table is overrepresented in terms of the questions. Um, but uh, I just have a very simple one. Uh, I found it very useful, uh, your, your use of the, the girls' education example. I was just wondering if you could give another example, maybe something that, uh, that you've, uh, you've been looking at whereby uh, a counterfactual analysis did not work for, for one or was not possible and that you applied um, uh, contribution analysis and, and, and just sort of walk us through your thought process. Thanks. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm arguing that, that sort of the concepts there sort of apply to most of the interventions that, that I think you're, you're involved in. So you should be able to take any one of them and, and, and sort of apply it. Um, uh, another one I've been looking at recently for some work I'm starting is uh, uh, in, the, in the area of aquaculture, I think that's the word, um, of, uh, of, of an of a intervention that was trying, is trying to uh, uh, get uh, poor farmers in Thailand to uh, start uh, freshwater fish farming as well as their other occupations. And they, uh, this was sort of a part of the CGIAR world. Um, and so they were doing research on how to create low cost food, fish food, uh, uh, using local materials, and they were providing training and, and, and methods to, to, to farmers. And the expectation was that uh, they, would, they would adopt this, they gave them startup funds, they would adopt it and carry it on in the future, and their neighbors, through examples, would also pick this up and carry it on. Um, and uh, I think, again, when you then start looking, okay, that's sort of the, the intervention, but there's all kinds of other things going on. Is there, is there uh, you know, uh, a market uh, for surplus fish? Part of it was that they would eat, eat some of this fish, improve their nutrition, as well as sell it and, and improve their income. Is there a market for the fish? Is there uh, an affordable market for the, f the uh, fingerlings they have to buy to start the fish, to start the fishes? Um, is there uh, support from their families uh, who may have to, their kids and wives and may have to sort of get have more involved in this practice than they <laughs> had thought? Um, um, so there's a, there's a whole range of, uh, of factors uh, that would affect whether or not this is gonna work or not. Um, 
um, my reading of the report was that it didn't work that well. Um, but again, it was to sort of think about it, uh, I think as a, another, uh, of any, almost any, as I say, any, any, any case you can think of, I think, of where there were lots of other factors involved. And uh, uh, they, it was those other factors, plus the intervention of the, the sort of local research and the training and the funding, all is needed uh, to, make, to make the thing work. And it, and it didn't work um, in the end. They didn't have, farmers didn't have enough, most of them, many of them dropped out after a while, didn't have money, didn't have enough money to buy the fisher, the fingerlings. Um, and, uh, um, and again, the report didn't get into why, they speculated a few things, but they didn't use this kind of approach to sort of get at understanding why things worked or didn't work. They were into this, their impact assessment world of economists and that sort of thing. So they weren't, I think, asking the, all the wrong questions about, about the intervention. But I, I do think if you think of almost any one of your interventions, it'll have a lot of other things have to happen in order for the things to work. And that's sort of the, and how do you take account of that? And I think it's thinking about this, because I was, I mean, this bothered me for, for some time as to how to think about this. And I, I did the contribution analysis, but it was always bugging me how this sort of links to causality. I, th I think we've been able to sort of uh, square that circle now. Uh, and I think there, again, I think almost every one of your, of your interventions does involve other, other players, other factors, um, other kind of things, some of which you may control, some of which you may want to try to control, uh, influence. Um, and that's sort of the world, that's the normal world of interventions. And I think this idea of contributory causes and principal contributory causes helps think through what that is. And I think variety of theory-based approaches help, helps, and some others uh, can help you sort of get at then how do you, how do you establish uh, then a credible claim of, of causality. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, which was quite, quite interesting. Uh, I would want to know, uh, in the example you gave, uh, you say that uh, Y causes X, but we also cannot rule out a case where Y, uh, y I mean, you said X causes Y. We can have cases where Y causes X, so in other words, what would be, the, what would be your comments on reverse causality, where Y causes X also? Would it mean that the theory of change that you used has broken down and you need to reverse everything else, or is there a problem of identification of the corresponding theory of change? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm interpreting that as, as a question that I think some of you must be, I, I understand, involved within some of your workshops, but the, this issue of complexity where you don't have even a sort of linear chain of things. You have feedbacks, and, uh, which sort of, as you say, then some of the, some of the results you observe then are feedback to influence prior, re, you know, sort of previous results, uh, and the whole issue of how do you, how do you handle complexity. Um, and I think there, um, uh, you, uh, I mean, most of the approaches there are involved uh, very much of a learning perspective, uh, an exploratory perspective on how how these how how things are influencing each other, uh, and I think that uh, still building theories of change, but then observing what's happening, what's not happening, and if you're observing Y causing X, well, then you've got to go back to the drawing box and and and, and make adjustments and, and try to account for that, and maybe change maybe that affects the intervention. Maybe you want to change uh, what you're doing or how you're doing it. Uh, and I think my uh, take on sort of evaluating complexity type of situations is, is, is the need to take a very learning feedback, quick feedback kind of approach to evaluation um, as opposed to um, the more traditional view of waiting till the end of the, or way down the line in an intervention and then coming in and looking at it. If you know you're dealing with a complex situation, uh, not quite sure the causal relationships, not quite sure what even the outcomes might be then you need to take a very incremental, I think, approach to it. And I think uh, still, I think some of these ideas would, could apply very, very, apply well there, but it, it does, uh, it's a different mode of how you, how you operate. The ones I've been, the examples I've been using have been more of a traditional approach, but even in, in them, you, one might, might have found, if you dug into it, doing sort of a realist evaluation approach, you may find that some of the, there are some of those feedback loops that you were not aware of 
and that ex starts to explain why things are working or not working, and you'd have to sort of build that in and, and take account of that. Um, hello. I was just wondering, is it um, contribution analysis, is it asking you to get a lot more information about the specific, the project or program specific influencing factors and relationships? to improve design or to improve your analysis or interpretation of the impacts it's had? And, and then, is it, does it always have to be project specific or could you replicate the data you get from one contribution analysis and apply it to a whole different sort of similar project in another part of the world? Um, there are um, a number of, I think, interesting applications of sort of what are essentially our contribution analysis in that uh, sort of design thinking stage. Uh, Franz has written about that in this evaluation issue coming out. Um, and there's a number of articles that have come out of, of um, in sort of a design stage or before implementation where building, building a theory of change and, 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 look, and, and questioning it, examining it, uh, has brought to light uh, issues of why the thing has likely or not likely to work. And, hopefully would then change the design of, of the intervention, uh, which you know, perhaps then could be used somewhere else. I think uh, I'd certainly started the contribution analysis in a, actually started in a, in a sort of performance management mode, but it certainly, uh, most of the discussion of it is in a um, the sort of after the fact evaluation, sort of standard evaluation mode. Uh, but again, in the, in the Evaluation issue coming out next month. Um, a couple of authors uh, based in Scotland and in Canada have write mostly about using contribution analysis in a planning mode to sort of help plan and design and a participatory planning mode. Uh, very big on the participatory aspect in, in Scottish health and some some health health protection type uh, programs here in Canada, and using the, that that as a as a tool for. Um, building better understanding of how the program might work and hence what the intervention might best do. So um, it has come, uh, uh, I think it has been used in that way and there's, there's, say, there's quite a number of interesting articles on that from that perspective that I think are quite, quite useful. And as I indicated in the talk, I think when, you know, I don't know if you've had sort of experience in evaluation, it's more often than not, unfortunately, you take a look at an intervention and a program and you start digging into it. How is it supposed to work? Tell me how you dig back. It, it doesn't look good. It looks kind of weak. <laughs> and it's not surprising maybe that it's not going to work or not to work the way at least you, you expected it. So uh, I think we all recognize the, the lack, the inadequate forethought in planning of, of these interventions that are all trying to accomplish some very complicated things. And um, uh, probably they all lack of they all lack adequate upfront thinking about why is this thing going to work, which is sort of the same question as sort of theory-based contribution analysis stuff. So I think there's a, a, a lots of room there for some interesting work in in applying uh, this some of these ideas in that in that vein. Uh, my question is actually uh, very much. It's quite simple. It's at the beginning of your presentation, you were taking the example of, uh, of um, this, of, uh, you were taking this example, and you were uh, giving um, the theory based on X and Y, and, uh, and you were three items saying if X, uh, uh, which is the intervention result, does it result in Y, is it necessary, is it sufficient? And you reply no to all questions. And, uh, my first reaction, if you reply no to all this question, it's stopped there. It means if it's not result, it's not necessary, it's not sufficient, uh, why go further? And in your development afterwards, you are indicating that it is actually necessary. So I just wanted to, to find out if actually when you start this kind of analysis with the three question, which is quite a good way of doing it, is it necessary, is it sufficient, and you actually have a no do you really need to, to go further uh, digging into, into the issue? Well, I, I, um, I do appreciate, and I worried about this, if sort of haven't thought about these issues a lot. They're, um, they're not, to me, they're now fairly obvious and straightforward. Um, last year, I spent um, a lot of time, 
hundreds of emails, Skype discussions with the team on this DFID report, debating, discussing all this stuff before it became more obvious. So, um, but I think if you think of the, the, the uh, smoking and lung cancer, you know, uh, smoking is, does smoking cause lung cancer? No. Is it necessary for lung cancer? No. Is it sufficient? No. It's neither sufficient nor it, it's a contributory cause. It's a different kind of causality. It's, it's uh, smoking plus other factors, perhaps genetic, perhaps, perhaps uh, environmental factors, end up with, with lung cancer. Um, that's, that's, that's sort of the example. Um, and I think the same with these interventions. You do end up saying that the, the package, the, pa the, the um, and I don't know enough about lung cancer to sort of push this example much further, but uh, in the interventions we're talking about, the interventions plus these assumptions that we're making as supporting factors, together they're sufficient. You hope they're sufficient to cause, to cause an impact. And you also hope that within that package, the intervention is needed, so that if you, didn't have the if you didn't have the intervention, then the package wouldn't be enough to make things happen. But that's not the same as saying the intervention is the only way to get the result, or the, or, or the intervention on its own is sufficient. So that's what I was sort of saying at the beginning. And um, it's just putting the thing in this context of the causal package being sufficient, and then within that package, uh, there is a, this, this idea of necessity of the, of the, of the intervention. Um, and I think, uh, as I say, it's not a, it, 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 as I say, we had, I, I can think back of how many long debates and discussions we had in trying to understand and make sure we had this right, but it's, uh, so, and I, I was, I'd say a little worried that it was a bit heavy for, for, uh, for a luncheon, but um, again, there's writings on it. If you go Google Innus, I-N-U-S, you'll, there's, Wikipedia's got some good stuff on it, and all kinds of, it's, it's all quite interesting and I think it works quite well. Thank you. John, thank you.